live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, how you doing, everybody? It is Wednesday, February 6th, 2019, the day after the State of the Union address. Uh, don't have much to say about that one, obviously. I don't watch it. I declare it as much. I don't know why you're here if you're thinking you're going to get me to digest the State of the Union address for you. Uh, if you watched it, God help you. I hope you made queso and at least consoled yourself with that. Uh, many of you, uh, I understand, didn't watch the State of the Union address, but uh, made sure to uh, uh, watch the response to the State of the Union address from Stacey Abrams. By all accounts, a good one. I, I did get to watch a little bit of that one. I never love the responses, no matter who's giving them. It's a It's a terrible job, and it's always difficult to do, and it's always a visual and... I guess what presentational is that even a word come down from the state of the union, uh, in, in an optics, uh, sort of way, which, uh, uh, is a terrible way to <laughs> have to consider anything, but it's a difficult act to follow the, uh, e- even when the act is terrible, quite honestly, as it was last night, uh, it should be an easy act to follow based on solely on the content of the speeches, but giving a speech to a joint session and in that room and with the acoustics and the crowd and the attention paid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult. It's a raucous setting, and I don't know how you can recreate it and put the response on equal footing, and I, I don't think it's even possible. I suppose you could set up you know, almost an arena-like setting but uh, it would be very difficult to do without trying to recreate the look of the hall of the of the house, and I think that would probably be too obvious. Anyway, it was uh, it was you know it went okay. She gave a good speech by all accounts, a, a very good one, and that's great. And I'll take it, and I'll uh, take your word for it. I only watched a little bit of it. Uh, the visuals of it were a little bit weird. Again, they tried, they, they racked their brains somewhere in the uh, democratic media consulting world to come up with a setting that would, I don't know what, uh, <laughs> I guess play on the strengths of the address that she was giving. And what they came up with is coral risers full of various and sundry people, uh, I guess, selected to display some diversity in the background, and they stood there uncomfortably for the 20 minutes or so of the speech and then applauded at the end. Um, it was very weird. For a while, it actually looked like they might have put her in front of a green screen and uh, been filming, <clears throat> and they may have. I'm still not entirely convinced that they didn't do this, but I think the ending establishing shot sort of straightened that one out. But anyway, uh, it didn't, it just wasn't visually very well composed, but that's, you know, it's not her fault. That's just the way it is with responses. That's the way it is with Republican responses all the time. And no matter what you do, it's always going to look something, look like something less. And that's the reason why, uh, why the, uh, uh, the response is such a thankless task. Oh, my. Boy, I got to work out the frogs this morning. Hmm. Seems to be nothing I can do about that, no matter how much I warm up before the show. Uh, it's nerves. I'm so nervous about talking to all you guys. Do you guys want to go to the prom? I could hardly get that out. Sorry. Anyway, uh, we'll move on from that. I feel like I'm sitting here uh, criticizing uh, the response, which I really shouldn't be doing, when the initial speech was so terrible and there's so much to criticize about that. Let's move on to that. Daily Coast Radio is live now. Uh, Bill has come in to say, k X, that's me. Hi. Good morning. I've been talking for five minutes. Is here to fulfill all your State of the Union recap needs in rich, luxurious, stereophonic sound. Is that what we're using here? Uh, I should have just coughed in all of your ears one more time to uh, my, to clear my throat. Okay. Well, 
lots of coverage of the speech out there. And that'll be about it for us. I mean, you know, it was full of lies and garbage. And uh, I don't really need to add that much detail to it. Uh, I really, I purposefully don't watch these things and really don't think you should either. And I did, I, I, I was uh, pleased to note that yesterday, along with the 538 take, the hot take going into the speech, I'm glad this is, we finally got to this point, was among the uh, media types that the speeches don't make a big difference. They don't matter. They don't move the needle in terms of public opinion. All of this is appears to be empirically true with data to back it up, uh, including now <clears throat> data establishing that uh, even the things that the presidents ask Congress to do as part of their agenda uh, in the upcoming year don't typically get done. Greg Dworkin is not with us today. He's actually got an appointment to take care of this morning, and so I'm going to have to turn to his written material, the abbreviated Pundit Roundup, uh, for that segment of the show, that is to say, this segment of the show. Uh, and uh, he writes, obviously, I think everyone, no one will be surprised by the headline, abbreviated Pundit Roundup's headline, Normalizing a One-Trick Con Man. That was the exercise we were engaged in last night. The State of Social Conservatives speech was last night. And guess what? There was no pivot. He writes, pretty obnoxious speech, to be honest, from President Baby Jails. On the other hand, teleprompter Trump is boring and Stacey Abrams was correct. Uh, here, quoting from PBS's NewsHour write-up of this, Stacey Abrams stepped onto the biggest stage of her political career Tuesday and accused President Donald Trump and his fellow Republicans of abandoning working Americans and fomenting partisan and cultural discord. Well, that sounds about correct. By the way... I very much enjoyed the happenstance of the timing of the State of the Union, which uh, comes courtesy of Nancy Pelosi. I don't think this was the aim of it, but as it happens, uh, for the president to deliver his State of the Union address, chock full of lies as it is, <clears throat> in concert with the discovery by MAGA Americans which is redundant, Make America Great Again Americans, uh, that their tax returns are not what they thought they were going to be, that their tax refunds in particular are not what they thought they were going to be, has been pretty interesting and exciting. Um, I don't know whether it represents a vast majority of taxpayers or not. In theory, the numbers say that it should, but the last couple of days on Twitter have been... <clears throat> Let's say, depending on how you want to approach this, uh, if you want to, if you if you want to revel in it, glorious. If you are trying to reach out across the aisle and bring these swing voters and possible independents over to the side of voting for Democrats in the next election, which uh, <clears throat> maybe it's possible. All of the I, so it depends where you're coming from uh, as to what you're going to make of these various tweets which are floating around at the moment. But um, it seems that there are quite a number of people who claim to have been either Republican voters for their entire lives or Trump supporters this last time around or whatever, people taken aback by the fact that uh, tax rebates, tax refunds, to which they have become accustomed over the past several years <clears throat> by uh, filling out their taxes more or less the same way because they are earning more or less the same amount. Their finances have remained relatively stable, which is not a great thing all by itself, by the way. But, you know, within the norm, obviously, not people just don't get gigantic raises all the time and there aren't very many middle class tax cuts on offer. Uh, by from this president or really any other that make a huge difference, huge difference, meaning the kind of thing that would make you uh, feel like you were more financially secure or let's say stave off economic anxiety, perhaps. Uh, anyway, people who have become accustomed to a certain level of tax refund 
found that that tax refund was not there for them this year and have taken that to mean that their taxes have been hiked considerably. Now, they have been hiked considerably. Um, I think the effect of the new tax law has been, unfortunately for, for Trump and his supporters, magnified by the fact that most people are pretty well, either have are pretty poor or have become relatively complacent tax planners over the past couple of years. And who has the you know, who has the opportunity to learn how to be a tax planner on top of all the other things that you have to do in your day to day life? Uh, but it's been pointed out and I actually have there's a couple of items that I put away in pocket that are, if I can find them now, I've, I've buried them in various interesting comments from uh, last night's proceedings. But there were a couple of uh, interesting and informative diaries on Daily Coast just the other day that, uh, one, highlighted the problem that people were experiencing, and two, explained that, well, yeah, I mean, your taxes did go up, but the fact that your refund is less doesn't mean that your taxes went up by the amount that you lost in refund. Uh, the design of the tax law, which was a very poor and partisan design, to be sure, was to give, give taxpayers small, immediate boosts in their take home pay so that their you know their pay stubs reflected a larger number of dollars and that was meant for people to then yeah, as they did then walk away and say spent the next year saying because of Trump I'm making more money there's more money in my pocket I'm losing less to taxation therefore my taxes have been cut and it worked for a year, it just didn't what didn't work huge. I, it wasn't hundreds of dollars in every paycheck. It was a couple of bucks in each paycheck for most people. Then, of course, it came time, as it always does, to pay the piper. Which, really, honestly, I have to get into piping. Apparently, that's the way to to make money in this country. Uh, not really. Hedge funds is the way to do it, um, and you don't need any special expertise to to do that, as it turns out. But that's not what the show is about. Anyway. What uh, this segment of the show is about is that uh, in exchange for a couple of extra bucks each week, uh, if you didn't do anything to change your withholding, and you wouldn't because you were enjoying the extra couple of bucks a week, um, if you had changed your withholding, you could have had the same tax refund that you always have, except that that's not really reflective of your taxes. That's how much did you overpay in taxes and you're getting back. So, you know, the real question would be to look at your total liabilities, plus or minus whatever refund you did or didn't get or any final payment you do or don't have to make in order to get square on your taxes and then look at that. But that's not what people look at. Optics, once again, rearing its... uh I don't know what, I guess this in this time, uh, this case, ugly head and reminding people that, uh, well, what happens to your wallet in the most immediate sense is the way you, you know, that's the impression you're going to walk away with and you're probably going to vote based on that. And it was extraordinarily foolish in that sense to line up, to, to purposefully align the sticker shock of losing your multi-thousand dollar tax rebate with the next State of the Union address. They thought, maybe, if they gave any thought to it at all, that they might get away with dropping the address in late January just in time to get that in under the wire to score whatever bump they think they can score with it and only then hit people with the surprise of losing your tax refunds a few days later and that they wouldn't coincide. But this time, apparently a significant chunk of the audience was watching angry that they felt like their taxes had been raised enormously. And uh, well, good job on that one. Well done. Well thought out. Okay. Let's see. As a matter of fact, the, um, 
the uh, diary I was thinking of here. Oh, I didn't want to skip over necessarily, but I'll, I'll maybe return to Craig's roundup for uh, inspiration on which direction to turn next. But you know how this stream of consciousness stuff works. Aldous Penny Farthing, Aldous J. Penny Farthing, writing this uh, for the diaries section over at Daily Coast, just rounding up that, that sentiment. Who boy, lots of people are really unhappy with their tax refunds this year. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I haven't gotten mine yet, so we'll see how mine works out. And I'm not much of a tax planner myself, but we'll see whether uh, my wife was on top of things or not and changed her withholding. Oh, I, so many weird things happened with her compensation this year that I have no idea where we're going to be in terms of uh, payment or refund. And, and uh, we're not even getting a clear picture of that yet. We're still gathering up the paperwork on all that. But I'm not sure how typical these complaints are. And I have also seen a lot of people suggesting that they're somehow not genuine, that they might be bot generated in a way. I don't really know what they're basing that on. I'm thinking that uh, they're basing it on one, the sudden volume of them, and two, the almost too perfect uh, composition of them. That is to say, uh, I don't know how the spelling is or the capitalization, but it's just what, what we mean. What I mean by that is that it seems too perfect for people to say, why, I've been a Republican all my life and I enthusiastically supported Donald Trump because I knew he was going to make things better in America and cut my taxes. And now he hasn't. And I'm so angry and I'll never trust you again and I'll never vote Republican ever, ever, ever again. The end, you know, sincerely john q public essentially and it seems like too good to be true in a way and so i suppose that's what's driving people's fear that they might not be entirely genuine but uh if they are aldous penny farthing has had a good time rounding them up they're just waking up he says i know just what they'll do their mouths will hang open a minute or two then the boobs down in trumpville will all cry boo-hoo Below is just a small sampling of Twitter reactions from taxpayers who expected a bigger refund following the passage of the GOP tax scam at the end of 2017. If this is being repeated across the country, and millions are yet to file, the backlash could be, well, extreme. It's one thing to serve the NCAA champs cold burgers and fries, or to, I don't know, insist on remaining president even though you're the goddamn stupidest sentient being in the universe, but if people don't get the refunds they're expecting, look out. And uh, let's see, here's one from, uh, well, from Impeach Trump saying, I'm starting to see a few tweets from folks saying they aren't getting the tax refunds that they were promised with the tax scam bill. Remember, we were told we'd be able to remodel our kitchens, buy a new car or take that big vacation. That seems true. And uh, that's not coming through. Here's a couple of those few tweets that they're talking about guy by the name of Jeff Dearborn, maybe, uh, addressing Donald Trump in his tweet, at real Donald Trump. I just got back uh, from my tax accountant. All I can say is you, uh, well, F word, except he p spells it with PH, which is funny. Ha ha. You effed us bad. On the same income as 2017, I went from getting a $6,000 refund for both state and federal uh, taxes to owing $2,000 total. I will never vote for you again. Your tax changes suck. That, of course, probably owing to the reality of having lost the deductibility of state income taxes. And, uh, yeah, that'll be targeting uh, blue states in particular. That was by design. So enjoy that one, Jeff Dearborn. Another person says, thanks, hashtag GOP tax fraud. Not only am I not getting a refund, hashtag refund, by the way, I now owe $6,000 more. Middle class tax mu uh, cut my, well, what would be ass, but is instead A, capital A, at sign, at sign. And I'm not really sure how that one's supposed to work. More of the same follows. There are several. Uh, and in fact, uh, dozens, because at least some of these tweets include screenshots, including multiple 
such tweets and Facebook posts. Uh, yeah. So a lot of people are uh, apparently quite angry about this, although, again, you know, it was certainly predictable. It was laid out as the, the purpose in the you know, in the case of uh, deductibility of state and local taxes, but doesn't appear to have prepared anybody for uh, for the impact of that. And, and you know, other uh, uh, diaries, as I mentioned, uh, did point out, um, I, I believe there was at least one from somebody who uh, is a tax professional of some sort explaining, uh, yeah, you know, again, it did eat up your refund, but what you did was you distributed that refund that you could have had among the 50 to 52, if you're lucky, uh, if you get paid every week, and a lot of people don't. So somewhere between, say, 26 and 52 paychecks, uh, you cut it up into you know 50 pieces and farmed it out and uh, took it that way. It's just that you blew it on... Well, I don't know whether you blew it on Starbucks coffee or not, but you certainly could have, in theory, blown it on Starbucks coffee all along the way. You uh, feeling any richer? No? Didn't work out for you? Okay. Well, sorry to hear about that. Okay. Back to uh, uh, the front page here. And I want... Oh, I've scrolled away from Greg's abbreviated pundit roundup. So let's uh, continue on and see where the stream of consciousness brings us next. Much more punditry to come on this waste of time Trump speech, he says. But meanwhile, we have this tweet from David Rothkopf. Tonight, one of the world's most renowned liars will stand in front of a room. He did it last night. And lie. And thereafter, college-educated men and women in suits and ties will go on television and try to interpret the meaning of those lies for an audience that knows them to be largely meaningless. <sighs> That's true. And here I am doing it for you now, although I am A, not on TV, B, not in a suit and tie, and C, not on, wait, did I say not on television already? Yes, I did. So twice I wanted to tell you I'm not on television. Greg Sargent at the Washington Post previewing the uh, speech and then panning it later on, of course, uh, but this was the the big warning that we got from a lot of the pundits that uh, Trump was going to come on and appeal for unity in the country and bipartisan comity, as he writes in his piece. And of course, uh, it was an easy prediction. That's what all presidents do with their State of the Union addresses, at least initially. Um, of course, it had nothing to do with Trump personally or where he stands or what he actually believes. And the big news of the early evening, pre-speech even, was that while the White House was shopping around this theme that he was going to be calling for national unity, etc., cetera, uh, he had spent the day, uh, once again, eating lunch, this time, again, with uh, news anchors and editors from around the country, uh, uh, during which lunch he was himself and told everybody how much he hated Democrats and politicians who... Uh, opposed him and what a bunch of idiots they all were and then he was going to then a give a speech about unity and b invite the uh, young man who happened to share his last name but is not related to him to the state of the union as his guest because the poor kid has been getting teased in school about his last name and so you shouldn't be bullying people and name calling kids but I will, I'll be delivering that message to you tonight uh, in front of an audience of morons and idiots and uh, people I will call out by name as being particularly stupid. That's, you know, that's his MO. That's the way he works. No surprise there. Let's see. Uh, what other uh, items do we have from the roundup? Well, uh, there are several. I guess really the big takeaway for me from having not actually watched it um, and watching from the periphery other people watching and reacting to it. From my perspective, the big moment of the night was the photo that captured Nancy Pelosi giving what appears to be, I don't know what, like who's such a good boy <laughs> patronizing 
hand clapping for something Trump did. It looks like there was a moment in the speech, you know, those of you who watched it will perhaps have a different read on it from what I could gather. From the outside, this is what it made it look like. That I guess at some point Trump turned to Pelosi and or Pence. Uh, Made it look in the photo like he was checking to see, you know, am I getting applauded by the important people behind me uh, who people can see on camera? And Nancy Pelosi appeared to be applauding already and uh, reading the situation of Trump casting about looking for people applauding for him. Uh, She made an over-the-top demonstration of the fact that she was doing that. Yes, Donald, you're getting the approval you so desperately crave. Okay, who's such a good president? Who's a good president? Oh, yes, yes. you're not. No, you're not. Maybe that's what was going through her mind. I don't know. That seems to be what everybody was talking about. Uh, Let's see. Other things we can wrap up from the speech? Well... Not too much more. Let me see if there's any comments coming in from others that we might want to add into the mix. And, of course, as we come up to our first break where we can regroup a little bit. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. There's talking about the uh, the take home pay and the the tax refund as well. That seems to be a big topic of discussion so we'll get on to that one later on other things to wrap up though there's more happening in various aspects of the investigations into donald trump for which he called uh, for an end last night a, a very unusual and uh, not really out of bounds usage of the platform of the state of the union to call for an end to personal investigations but hey that's donald trump for you we'll be right back Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new interruption, though it's still aimed at saying thank you to all of you who are supporters of the show. We've made a lot of progress. When we first started this campaign, fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners were donating to help keep us on the air. And now, that's down to about 1 in 15. But we've got a long way to go. Remember, it won't take much. Our average monthly donation is currently about $7.00 for which you're getting two hours of great news and entertainment five days a week. What's that, 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal. But as a wage, well, I think Democrats would be against it. But if we all put our 70 cents together, or even half of us, that'd really be something. And my kids could go to college. Now, that's not all on you. But remember, Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is there to make it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box. And you'll be right there where you need to be to make easy, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your continuing support. Welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. Oh, yes, one other thing I did want to remind you of. Uh, You doubtless uh, saw it and heard about it, and if you are a regular K-Grow in the Morning listener, you are probably very excited to find out or to be able to spot and identify the pin that the speaker was wearing on the lapel of her jacket, and Greg made sure that I knew about it, sending me the tweet of... Natalie Andrews from the Wall Street Journal uh, pointing out that the uh, speaker's gold brooch, uh, which is a weird word, by the way, and I've always marveled over the pronunciation of this as more more brooch than brooch, even though it's spelled as brooch, although Natalie here has spelled it as B-R-O-A-C-H, which is probably the better spelling for it, quite honestly. Anyway pointing out that this gold pin was a gift to her from former House lawmakers, apparently, when she won the speakership this year, according to her spokesman, Drew Hamill. The uh, pin, of course, a small replica of the mace of the, well, the mace of the Republic, or the mace of the House of Representatives. Uh, And k Grown and Morning listeners know all about the mace, the role it plays, where you'll see it. Uh, they may even have recognized it from by sight, which was fantastic. There was a number of comments about it, and even a uh, even a even a top-rated diary from Subir on uh, Daily Coast. Here, Speaker Pelosi wore a symbol of her authority on her lapel, which, well, 
in some respects, all members actually did do that in order to uh, get in and out of the house easily and get past the Capitol Police. They all wear little pins that indicate that they are members of the House of Representatives, which are, I guess, typically, uh, you know, uh, technically speaking, a, a symbol of their authority on their lapel. But this one was a special one, and I was uh, happy to be able to to point out, yeah, Kegro in the Morning listeners, they all know the mace. Everybody knows. You don't have to tell us about the mace. God damn it. I don't even know if we wanted to throw in a little bit of profanity just for fun to make our point. But uh, anyway, uh, was it clearly uh, the QAnon people would have said it was a clear signal to us that she endorses the K-Girl in the Morning program and uh, you all ought to uh, feel great pride, take great pride in your support of the program uh, your financial support of the program, for instance, or just your listenership. But uh, if you if you feel well served by having <laughs> learned more about the mace of the House of Representatives than possibly anybody else on the planet, or certainly any other podcast listeners, though they're all playing catch up this morning, I can tell you. Uh, well, then fine, Patreon dot com slash k x is the place to do it although now i understand uh, i was reading some crazy articles yesterday stream of consciousness once again uh that patreon has some issues and i suddenly freaked out like oh, we're gonna have to move again i don't i hope that's not the case but, uh, those of you who are longtime listeners and donors will remember that we started out on a platform called recurrency they basically did exactly the same thing as patreon but they went out of business and I have a feeling that they were driven out of business by a lot of the same things that now stand poised to possibly do the same thing to Patreon. Um, long story short there, venture capital, like the worst, just the worst thing in the world. And if you can avoid taking it, do they just eat your company? I don't understand. There's <clears throat> long exposition of the problems, but I guess uh, without materials to deliver it to you, and really, who wants to spend all the show on that? Long story short there, uh, look, all the company does is say, hey, if you want to donate money to support a a, an, a creator of uh, something that you enjoy, I mean, and Patreon covers everybody, podcasters, yes, but artists, uh, comic book writers, uh, regular book writers, People who don't even write anything at all, but uh, musicians, uh, anything. I guess anything that you uh, feel justified in asking for financial support for, including this crappy podcast, um, all they do is essentially make it easy for creators to organize such a community, give them a place where it's pretty easy to click a couple of times and send a couple of bucks a month, to people they support, and in return, you know, there's other various functions, and the creators can, can sometimes put out exclusive content for their donors. Uh, and uh, I guess to that extent, Patreon is not a, not you know, it's no worse a fit for me than anything else, recurrency or anything else, but uh, I've never felt comfortable with the idea of exclusive content for donors. I mean, it makes sense, and it's called, you know, sales. <laughs> <laughs> in in other contexts, but when you're doing a podcast like this one, and particularly under the Daily Coast flag, um, literally, sort of, not it's not really a flag, but it's a visual representation of a flag. You get the idea. This isn't a pipe, and that's not a flag. But anyway, uh, I've never really felt comfortable with the idea of you know, well, you know, only if you pay do you get this. Even though you know, there's plenty of good stuff for free, uh, but you know, Patreon. They have all kinds of, you know, add-ons and gizmos and doodads where people who are artists, for instance, will send you a sketch on a napkin for 500 bucks or whatever. I don't know what they're going to do. But uh, we don't make use of most of those things. But Patreon, it's it's a great idea and it is scalable. And they are always saying uh, in the VC world, well, is what you're doing scalable? As it turns out, though, the problem isn't, is it scalable? It's uh, what the venture capitalist folks are asking is, can I continue to get more and more money out of it is the issue. Yeah, it's perfectly scalable. It doesn't cost anything at all for Patreon to add more 
patrons or creators or both, and they make more money every time somebody does because they take a certain percentage of the of the contribution for themselves. That's the business model. If you give somebody a hundred bucks a month, I don't know uh, if anybody does that, but if they do, congratulations. We'll take five bucks out of that and pass 95 on. That's a pretty sustainable business model. It's scalable and sustainable, two very big buzzwords. But venture capitalists basically ask, isn't there some way that I could have all of that $5? Or couldn't we make it 10 and then I could have all of that $10? And uh, it drives uh, the businesses that they invest in to do things that aren't really necessary to the core functioning of the business, and which extract money and make people upset with the business model. And it's no longer interesting or fun to me. I don't like the idea that 10, 15, 20% of the money that I wanted to give to a person who does something I like is now going to a person I don't know and who does things I don't like, like extractive exploitation of everybody else's ideas and hard work, as venture capitals are wont to do. Anyway... Didn't want to get off on that tangent either, but that's what comes of doing a stream of consciousness show. All right. I don't know how, how do we even get here? I have no idea. Let's move on to uh, a couple of other things. Oh, yes. It was about how wonderful we were for reminding you uh, or having prepared you ahead of time about the mace and so that you could identify it as the pin on Nancy LaPelle's, Nancy LaPelle's Pelosi. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> that's where it was. Right on her Pelosi, right? She just hit her right in the Pelosi, which uh, sounds interesting. Anyway, uh, moving on. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I guess one more thing about the State of the Union, I guess, or one or two more uh, uh, items about it. The, uh, a lot of people uh, <clears throat> pointing out, I think what Donald Trump or Donald Trump's advisors thought was going to be the moment, <clears throat> the key line from the speech. I think not only did he think it was in bounds to include in there a passage about how you really should all stop investigating me, I think they really thought that that was going to be a highlight, an applause line. And not only wasn't it one, but there was really weird, awkward silence for it. As a matter of fact, Daniel Dale uh, was, of course, following along and trying to document how much uh, of a lie each sentence was. And uh, he captured the text of the thing for us in case we can't play the audio of it. Uh, Trump uh, leading into this line by saying an economic miracle is taking place in the United States. This, by the way, right in conjunction, apparently, with thousands of people finding out that they had reason to uh, lodge grievance against Trump and his administration for stealing money out of their pockets with taxes. That's the economic miracle. Uh, and the only thing that can stop it, this economic miracle, and I guess now that everybody realizes the miracle is that he's stealing from you, maybe, uh, maybe this won't work out. But the only thing that can stop this alleged economic miracle, he said, are foolish wars. Well, we'll have some of those politics or ridiculous partisan investigations. And everybody began rolling their eyes. Oh, my God, here it comes. And then they followed up with what I guess was supposed to be a rhymed line, like it's going to fit on a bumper sticker or something. If there is going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. But um, hilarious! Like Mike Huckabee, did you write that? That was awful. Uh what a what a! I mean, first of all, just the the premise line, right? There's like lots of people out there saying, "Well, what do you wish for the country?" Well, a lot of people do say peace. Usually, comes with peace, prosperity, right? People love the alliteration more than the rhymes, believe it or not. When it comes to sloganeering, peace and prosperity. Yes, but prosperity doesn't rhyme with anything we want to say. We want something that rhymes with investigation. A rhymed line is something people can take away and repeat. That's the beauty of lines. Although I think the more powerful, like I said, is the alliteration. People sometimes forget which P word you're with. Peace and prospective. P 
paranatal. I don't know what. Uh, I forget what the P words are. The the P tape will have the answers if you just rewind it, and you'll find out. But uh, those those work pretty well. But rhymes, I think somebody was hinting that this was Kellyanne Conway's idea, and I don't know why they thought that. Maybe she admitted that it was. I have no idea. But anyway, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, the rhyming thing, uh, people can remember it. But the the rhyme words, A, have to be things that people say all the time. And B, the whole thing has to hang together and make sense, right? So, okay, what rhymes with investigation? Legislation does not, actually. The shun, T-I-O-N, is the same. Uh, but it, uh, it's barely a rhyme. It would pass in a song parody contest as a rhyme, I guess. But if there's going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. Peace and war are obvious flip sides, A, B. Uh, so that makes some sense. But peace and legislation doesn't. Like, is there, well, are we going to have peace and legislation in this country? I don't know. Are we? I mean, I guess so. I hope. I, I don't know. That's what legislators do. But you, typically speaking, nobody goes, nobody roots for that. But I can't wait for some legislation. Woo! They may have specific policy goals in mind. I want them to do this. I want them to do that. There should be sensible gun laws in this country. They should cut my taxes. Uh, they should do something about health care. Uh, uh, I need a law about who can go to the bathroom where. Some people do say that. Uh, but they never say... I am hopeful for an era of peace and legislation. So as a premise, it makes no sense. And then, of course, the follow-up, which was there cannot be war and investigation, which is, uh, I, I mean, I guess you could think that investigation was an, a flip side to legislation. Two things that the Congress does. One, they could be legislating. Two, they could be investigating. Uh, but really, you know, they, again, if you're explaining the joke, it's not working. So I don't know. That was supposed to be a big deal and a big hit and a big takeaway. And instead it produced a lot of awkwardness. This is the way it uh, appeared in, in uh, uh, Center for American Progress's Caps tweet about it. The most memorable line of Trump's State of the Union speech begging to avoid accountability for his corruption and the awkward bipartisan silence in response. So let me see. I guess I'll have to play it on the laptop and see if we can pick up the audio for it. It was kind of loud, as I recall. So let me see if uh, if it plays. You can hear this awkward silence. Uh, oh, I got a. Oh, uh, so it's automatically muted at first, which is very helpful, uh, typically speaking. But this time I actually do want to hear the audio. Let's play that. If there is going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, as responses to a line in the State of the Union go, like I said, the uh, it, that smattering of applause and uh, murmuring that went along with it, and this, this is, <laughs> there's this really strange cockeyed look on... Nancy Pelosi, and quite, quite honestly, on Mike Pence's face, too. He wants to be giving a wry smile that everybody thought was going to be, you know, be uh, it, look good in context as the applause rolled in from the Republican side. But he's detecting that there's, in fact, silence for the most part, plus this smattering of applause. That little teeny bit of applause, by the way, is about as loud as the response was likely to get had they gone ahead with something stupid like holding the State of the Union address in the Senate chamber. That's one of the reasons I I, I was enthusiastic about his possibly doing that because they just won't be able to get the size of the crowd you need. I mean, that's a very large crowd in there murmuring. It's not silence like crickets, but as as responses to the State of the Union lines go that was nothing because that place can explode in a in roars of approval or 
or booze for that matter, and applause, it's very loud, very loud in the hall of the house, and uh, you, you hear nothing on this. And of course, Trump has this look on his face, looking around, he's got this self-satisfied smug, he believes he's delivering the home run of the speech, and nothing happens. And then that, I don't know whether that just doesn't work that way, line was in the text or not, or whether he ad-libbed it to fill the silence, but it is super awkward. Let me just get the last couple seconds of that. Does that work? Can I play that? Yeah. That silence right at the end after it just doesn't work that way. That smattering of applause dies away and everybody, and the murmuring is, did he just say what I think he said? What a dick. I mean, I think you can say that, right? That guy got away with saying that on television once. All right. Well, it didn't work out very well for him and that, but I wanted to note that, and that was super awkward and difficult to take. Moving on to other items that uh, made the rounds yesterday. Let's see. Uh, There was, of course, the moment that Peter Segal noted for us here. Trump doesn't understand why the Democratic women got up and cheered when he talked about women getting new jobs. That was also a big moment in the speech uh, that I didn't see, once again, but I saw people reacting to. And, uh, yeah, it seems like he really didn't get the idea there. Women in the House, of course, are now overwhelmingly Democratic, and those of them who got new jobs got those jobs very often by defeating Trump supporters and replacing them in Congress or preventing them from reaching Congress in the first place if there was an open seat available. Yeah, he really seems to not have clued into that particular self own either. Uh, another weird thing observed right at the beginning of the speech, too, I should take note of this for procedure nuts, and this is the only part of the speech I really ever do enjoy, is watching the procedure and pageantry, I guess, of it, uh, the president being introduced in the House and then being introduced again, normally, uh, from uh, at the Speaker's rostrum by the Speaker of the House. But Stephen Portnoy of CBS News Radio noting in a tweet yesterday, very strange, Trump did not wait for the Speaker to introduce him to the Congress, which is the protocol. Pelosi looked surprised that Trump began his speech without waiting for her to introduce him. That's certainly par for the course in Trump world. So not a huge surprise, but, uh, you know, caught people off guard nonetheless. He's going to ignore protocol all the time and and say he meant to do it too. That's another, I guess, of the uh, takeaways from yesterday. And I guess, did this come out of the lunch with the news anchors is that where he was let's uh let's move on to that piece and share the contents of the new york times reporting there just to give some context for that before expected call for unity trump laced into democrats at lunch of course at lunch for tv anchors and who else would he be talking to i want to talk to the people i see on telly telly and do it over lunch i'm hungry When do we eat? I'm starving. Peter Baker and Michael Grinbaum reporting this one for the New York Times for public consumption. The president, uh, oh, sorry, President Trump planned to use his State of the Union address on Tuesday night to appeal for bipartisan unity. Please let me off the hook for whole time's sake. But at a private lunch, what other kind would there be for Donald Trump? For television anchors, what kind of, what other kind would there be for Donald Trump? Earlier in the day, when he does everything, he offered searing assessments of a host of Democrats. What do you know? Mr. Trump dismissed former Vice President Joseph R. Biden Jr. as dumb, called Senator Chuck Schumer of New York a nasty son of a bitch, and mocked Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia, who he said, once again, going back to this one, choked like a dog, which is an amazing thing that he keeps saying, and I don't know why at a news conference where he tried to explain a racist yearbook photo, according to multiple people in the room. 
uh, that would be the multiple people in the room with the president saying these things, not Ralph Northam and what he was up to. Choked like a dog. I was just wondering whether uh, there was... Uh, who's with me here? Eric Posmo. Maybe uh, recognize this one since he was making reference to New York radio things. I choked like a dog. There was in the in Trump's eighties glory days, which is where most of his garbage views, phrases, thought patterns come from. There was in the New York radio market a uh, the 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 top. Uh, Top rated, you know, pop music station Z100. I guess they were the top rated, you know, the, the, the top 40 station. Uh, they had a morning zoo show. And among, you remember the whole trend where your morning show everywhere in the country, that was a formulaic thing. Morning zoo, you know, with, with whatever, some wacky named people, and they would get in there and uh, make jokes, do the weather. Uh, sound effects, and then uh, try to make gross jokes from time to time, and uh, sort of a you know like a knockoff. I guess they were trying to. I don't know what they were trying to do. Uh, anyway, but uh, Z100 Morning Zoo, wee wong, ding 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 ding, ring ring, honka honka, right? All that stuff. Uh, they had a guy on who did a recurring character. I don't remember any of the skits. Except that I heard, you know, my mom once talking about it. I heard this, uh, he, they do this funny skit in the morning. It's not funny. All right. Uh, and it was, there was a Mr. Leonard was his name. He, a guy, I guess his name was Leonard, but he wanted to be Mr. Leonard. I don't know what that was supposed to be. And he had this, you know, uh, weird delivery and bizarre dialect that he talked in. And I don't remember anything about him except that he used to say, He'd do this goofy commentary and he would wind up by saying that whatever it is that he was talking about would make Mr. Leonard something, you know, more something than a dog. And it was always, you know, sicker than a dog, you know, something else than a dog. I don't know whether it was consistently sicker than a dog. I can't tell you. I wasn't a fan of the show. I never listened to it, but that stuck with me was this one phrase. And I'm wondering whether that's where Donald Trump got the dog thing. Is it just what's left in his brain from Z100 Morning Zoo Mr. Leonard skits? I really don't know. But I'm offering that as a possibility. And those of you who grew up in the New York area and may have had the misfortune. Now, I'm not getting down on you. No judgment on you for having listened to the Z100 Morning Zoo. People do weird things in the morning. Whatever keeps you company. Uh, whatever gets you ready to go up and go to school, go to work, whatever it is, unless you're listening to Stormfront Radio or something like that, in which case, F you. Huh. Anyway, but if you remember the Mr. Leonard, is that, am, I, am I wrong? Does that ring a bell for you? Did he not do that all the time? Did I only happen to hear that one show and that stuck with me for some reason? Or is Donald Trump, I, you know, like everything else, comes out of television or radio for him? I figured this might too. Anyway. So that's not the news. The news is he had lunch with the network news anchors and the White House declined to comment on the president's remarks, but apparently this made it into the newspaper. Energized and blunt, Mr. Trump held little back, they report, during this lunch at the White House to preview the State of the Union address. As he has in past years, he offered an unvarnished, unscripted view of the political world that went well beyond the heavily vetted speech he delivered to a joint session of Congress and a national television audience. He seemed confident about his chances for re-election next year. That's dumb. Breaking down the emerging field of possible opponents with scathing assessments and predicting that Democrats would move so far to the left that it would make it easier for him to win a second term. He said he hoped he would get to run against Mr. Biden. I hope it's Biden, Mr. Trump said. Biden was never very smart. He was a terrible student. His gaffes are unbelievable. No self-awareness at all. When I say something, this is the important part. When I say something that you might think is a gaffe, it's on purpose. It's not a gaffe. When Biden says something dumb, it's because he's dumb. Hmm. I might conclude almost the exact opposite there, but okay. Uh, Fine. Of course, then he launched into Elizabeth Warren and ha 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 and Pocahontas 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I hope I haven't wounded Pocahontas too badly. He said, "I'd like to go run to run against her." Yeah, I'm sure he would. By the way, back, that back in the news again too. Don't think we'll get to that story. Mr. Trump said that Senator Kamala Harris of California has had the best campaign kickoff of any of the Democrats so far, a comment he also made last week in an interview with the New York Times. He dismissed Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks, who is exploring a possible independent candidacy. He doesn't have a shot, Mr. Trump said. Not a shot. Of course, people said that about him, too. Uh, let's see. He goes on. Schumer's a nasty son of a bitch. He has something to say about Pelosi. Pelosi said is nice to him in private, but then says terrible things about him on camera. Yeah, at least it's on camera. Hmm. Anyway, not a big uh, change from what goes on in his life. But uh, there you have it. I mean, that's about all we can cram in, I guess, before our next break. But uh, just wanted to put that on the record and be able to share that entire piece with you in the roundup piece that Scott will be posting later on today. Uh, but that was the important takeaway that, uh, well, you see, when Biden makes a gaffe, it's because it's dumb. When I make a gaffe, it's not a gaffe. I meant to do that. I meant to walk into that wall. I meant to not be able to find the exit. I meant to say the exact opposite of what was true. I meant to type Cov Fe Fe and tweet that out. In other words, as uh, somebody put it last night, yeah, I'm stupid on purpose, says the President of the United States. That's that's kind of where we are with this gang. And uh, hopefully I can scroll back before we exit for the break and actually give credit for that line because it went over pretty well last night. Hmm. We'll see uh, uh, whether I get there or not. All right, I think we're just about done with wrapping up this thing I didn't see. Uh, but uh, like I said, most of the fun for me is in rounding up the reaction to all this. Ah, there it is. Jason Sparks. Well done. I'm stupid on purpose, says the president. And that pretty much summed it up. We'll be right back once again after this short break. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, let's see. Oh, look at this. Here's a suggestion for an alternative line from the speech last night. Karen sends us here. Uh, if there's going to be peace and legislation, adopt this fine Dalmatian. That does that works a lot better. Uh, my goodness. Okay, that's a, a good one. Albert Titus, by the way, is noting, uh, I think they pre-taped the State of the Union speech and played it back at half speed last night. That would have been a good thing to do. Uh, with, uh, or there was somebody the other day that, uh, we credited properly at the time with the idea of taking Trump's speeches and slowing them down to half speed without changing the pitch. And it just makes him sound like a, a slurring drunk, which, you know, that's, uh, largely where he is mentally speaking. And I think I would like to have heard at least part of it, although that would have taken two hours to get through because it was a very very long speech all right let's see uh what do we have here michael musson says fun party game uh dan zach apparently suggesting via twitter dan zach uh washington post reporter uh love this annual tradition says dan before tonight these words had never been uttered during a state of the union address bloodthirsty sadistic fentanyl and surprisingly womb well that is surprising that that one's left and there are others apparently in the linked article that is interesting the words trump used in his state of the union that had never been used before that is an an interesting approach on uh to to the analysis uh, and here are a highlighted list of them uh, in partial context, we got through the first bunch of them. Bloodthirsty, chilling was in there too. Freeloading, wow. Legend, is that not, uh, that's not made it? That's interesting. Heartache, that's surprising. Hurtling, kissing, hmm, okay. Outspend, some of these are actually surprising. Rekindle, screeched, swat venomous and womb there are it's a weird collection 
Some of them actually more surprising than others. Uh, is this uh, worth sharing the entirety of the piece? Uh, how interesting. Well, it's an interesting idea. Ruben Fisher Baum, Ted Melnick, and Kevin Schau put this together. In his second official State of the Union, remember why that is, right? President Trump referred to sadistic human traffickers, that's different from the kind of human trafficking he was doing, I guess, and spoke of the heartache felt by the families of those killed by illegal immigrants. <laughs> Jeez. Dating back to George Washington, the President of the United States has previously made over 200 joint addresses to Congress. Neither of those words had been used before. I don't really know why no one used heartache. Maybe it's just not really a quality word. But okay, in order for a word to be new, any word that shares the same root has to be new as well. No president said legends or legendary before tonight either. We've also removed people's names, places, contractions, and acronyms. Uh, although they did say SWAT was in there, didn't they? That's, that's an acronym. Uh, words that hadn't been said in the State of the Union or annual addresses until this president said them. Um, every president adds some new words to the presidential lexicon. It's a, actually a dumb measure overall. Like, do you know no president has ever said legendary before? That tells me nothing. Whereas, you know, new words entering the lexicon in general, uh, transgender, as they point out here, Obama became the first president to say, uh, bisexual, lesbian, and transgender. And it really, you should just start the speech with that. Uh, Miss, you know, Mr. Speaker or Madam Speaker, as the case may be, uh, for some part of his presidency, uh, Mr. President of the Senate, the distinguished guests, uh, justices of the Supreme Court, bisexuals, lesbians, and transgender individuals. You just throw it right in there. At the, or just why even bother with that kind of context? The State of the Union is strong. Lots of clapping. Bisexual, lesbian, transgender. Now, as for taxes, I mean, why not? But, uh, well, of course, he's the first president to have said that. Uh, although uh, some may point out, and they'd be right, that, uh, well, I guess all such uh, people were, you know, in exi they existed Right? for all various presidencies. But yeah, you're probably not going to get, let's say, I don't know, um, Grover Cleveland is not going to say, you know what, it's time to talk about transgender individuals. Uh, George Washington, likewise, it just wasn't going to come up. So in a sense, I'm not surprised. And also, of course, bioterrorism caves is what, uh, you know, because they... Bioterrorism, caves, jihad, now you understand why caves, and firefighter, right? Okay, so these are the reasons, uh, well, these are the new words that George W. Bush introduced. Bioterrorism, again, also not going to be on uh, George Washington's agenda. Caves did exist, but they weren't really a big problem. Uh, jihad is how that got in there. Firefighter, why that was never in there, I have no idea. Interesting thought that these things should be tracked. Trump has lots of them. Um, some of them are just not indicative of anything. Others tell us a little bit about him and the kinds of words that he would want to choose and the stories he'd like to tell. From 2017, which was not a State of the Union address, thank you very much, uh, I would say the only surprises there or the only things that are particularly revealing would be quarterback. Uh, and then, of course, um, a few other strange things that got thrown in there, uh, but make more sense. It's not like, I don't think any other president would necessarily have ignored them, but quarterback has to get in there. What was the context? They made a nice tool you can hover over things with your cursor and figure out what was the context. Um, and uh, th in this case, he's talking about, uh, it says here, Jamil Shaw Jr. was an incredible young man with unlimited potential who was getting ready to go to college where he would have excelled as a great college quarterback, but he never got the chance. 
Uh, we probably need more context to that. I don't necess- I don't remember anything about anybody's speeches because I don't watch them. But um, there you have it. anything else that like 2018. I see booby came up, but I imagine that probably didn't come up in the way you were thinking. Ah, yes, uh, booby trapped. And really, honestly, should not the phrase or the word have been booby trapped? I think they were looking for clickbait on that one. Just putting booby out there. Crutches. That's. That's interesting too, that, uh, but I don't think it tells us anything in particular about Donald Trump himself. Uh, other things in the 2019 words we got. Now, SWAT was included. I thought they were excluding that as an acronym, but okay. Do we learn anything else from any of these other ones? Uh, not really. President Obama is included. President Bush is included. How far back do they go? Clinton. I guess that's as far back as they go with this stuff. But uh, I I don't even know what to tell you. I mean, after a while, like this segment, it just becomes useless babble. I mean, do you what do we have? What do we learn from the fact? And it is a fact that until 1996, when President Clinton said it, no other president had used the word hook in their speeches now it wasn't it's not in the context of hooking up don't don't get me wrong that's not what we're talking about just the word hook some say that the taxpayer should pick up the tab for toxic waste and let polluters who can afford to fix it off the hook wow i can't believe no one ever used the word hook until then that is so so super weird. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else that likewise deserves that sort of ridicule? Untargeted in 1998 made its first. The word cows made its first appearance in 1993, which is also weird because uh, George Washington did know about cows. And maybe even in this context, we're going to have to have no, we're going to have to have no sacred cows except the fundamental abiding interest of the American people, we learned in 1993 in a non-State of the Union address. But, uh, all right, I think we're going to be done with this one. I guess it's an interesting idea. It just didn't yield a whole lot. <laughs> I guess we'll say that. Okay. Uh, moving on from there. Oh, let's see. I do have. I did get a message here from Joan. This is going to be a tough day. Uh, It turns out we have personnel issues. There's a general strike going on at uh, at the Daily Coast World Headquarters. Not really. But uh, folks who are out, and that means that Joan is stuck in place, and we're not going to have – we're not going to have her either. Everybody has – has chickened out. You're all afraid. Debate me, I dare you. Anyway, uh, this is where we uh, this is where we now stand. So we'll have to comb through this on our own. I feel abandoned, and I I blame America for that. Thank you, and everyone will now applaud. And uh, let's see. All right, Michael. Uh, just to sum things up, after having sent us on that wild goose chase <laughs> through the various words that have never made it into the State of the Union. Personally, I was expecting nipple and button, and that's true. You uh, you really would have thought that that would have made an appearance in the State of the Union as well, especially with this president. Okay, so uh, let's see. Where else shall we go here? Uh, hmm. Let's take a look at... Uh, let's revisit another of our favorite stories, the corruption and criminality around Trump's inaugural committee, getting yet more attention. ProPublica writing a piece the other day, uh, focusing on Tom Barrack. I'm guessing that's how he pronounces his name, by the way. I mean, uh, now that I know he's actually, uh, his family is of, of Middle Eastern origin. Is it is it not Barack? Like, you know, in the same way as Barack Obama, but you'd never allow you to pronounce it that way or did they anglicize it a long time ago on purpose in order to hide that i wonder i don't really know it doesn't really make a difference 
But uh, just telling you, I don't know how he pronounces this thing, but I think that's it. Confidential Memo, company of Trump inaugural chair, Barrack, sought to profit <gasps> from connections to administration and foreigners? That's outrageous. I can't believe that they didn't see that one coming. Uh, the memo outlines how Colony, the company founded by Tom Barrack, an investor who chaired the inaugural uh aimed to exploit its connections to Donald Trump. That is outrageous. Federal prosecutors are conducting a wide-ranging probe into the nonprofit that ran the inaugural. And I'm sure that must have uh, must have burned their tongues like vinegar to have to say that they were working for a nonprofit. Because why would I work for something other than profit, right? Uh, so, you know... Uh, Not surprising. What was that noise? The investment firm founded by the chairman of Donald Trump's inaugural committee, Tom Barrack, developed a plan to profit off its connections to the incoming administration and foreign dignitaries, according to a confidential memo obtained by WNYC and ProPublica. Don't write this stuff down. Is my that's my advice to you, the listener. I don't want you caught in wrongdoing. These people, I encourage to put this in writing all the time because it is my dream to see them all imprisoned. By the way, the writing here is that of Justin Elliott of ProPublica and Ilya Maritz of WNYC. Need to credit them for their work here. The key, they continue on, is to strategically cultivate domestic and international relations, quoting this memo, of course, while avoiding any appearance of lobbying. The memo says that's a good idea. Oh, and also hiding this memo. I forgot to say Uh, that should have been included. Colony, which primarily invests in real estate, not that that's any barrier to stealing money from elsewhere, sought to capitalize on its access to the White House to get an early lead on infrastructure investments, of which there have been none, and to attract assets from potential investors. So bad read on the infrastructure thing, but okay. Federal prosecutors in Manhattan on Monday subpoenaed documents from the nonprofit 58th Presidential Inaugural Committee, including anything related to foreign donations. Such donations to Presidential Inaugural Committees are barred by law. So if you could get information on them, you would have to say that those people would be in trouble. There shouldn't be any information on them because there shouldn't be any such donations. But if there are such donations, I guess... Don't document them. Uh, I'm glad you did, though. Keep up the good work. Investigators are probing whether foreigners gave money in exchange for influence with the incoming Trump administration, NBC News reported, and all the rest of us effing knew since birth. But pardon my editorializing. The memo from Barack's, let's call him that, uh, investment firm, then called Colony North Star, is dated February 2017, just a month after the inaugural festivities organized by Barrack, if we'll call him that this time, who is a longtime Trump friend and therefore uh, obviously a grifter. The colony memo shows how the company was positioning itself to take advantage of Barrack's relationship with Trump and foreign officials immediately after the president was sworn in. Barrack hosted a chairman's dinner during the inaugural week with his own invite list, which included business people and foreign dignitaries. Contact, cultivation, conversion should be the mantra and objective of Colony North Star's international program in D.C. and internationally, the memo said. No other firms can currently match the relationships or resources that we possess, it added. The memo outlines a strategic plan for Colony, which now has $44 billion under management to ramp up its operations in Washington and open an office there. It envisions setting up roundtables between ambassadors and members of the administration to cultivate relationships in areas including infrastructure and plans to tie into international bilateral meetings already occurring with key members of the Trump administration. This would include taking a leadership role in the forming, informing the events, the participants and the agenda. Hmm. 
really don't write that down. Barrick's company should do all this while keeping a low profile and hiding it better, seeking to build a subtle brand, the memo says. The colony spokesman said in a statement, this memo was simply an outline of a proposed potential business plan, which was never acted on or implemented. Colony at no time has maintained a D.C. office. It's just like Trump Tower Moscow, which, oh my God, they're arresting him. Let's not say that. A person familiar with the creation of the memo said it was written by Rick Gates, who's totally not in trouble, who was deputy chairman of the inaugural committee and then hired by Barrick as a colony consultant. The memo is on colony letterhead. Gates, who was fired by Colony after he was indicted in Robert Mueller's Russian interference investigation in 2000, October of 2017, did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Gates has pleaded guilty to conspiracy and lying to the FBI, and he is cooperating with law enforcement. Hmm. While Colony says the plan in the memo was never adopted, Barrack was frequently present at meetings with government officials in the early months of the Trump administration. Why? He doesn't have anything to do with the administration. But hey, let's just have him sitting in here anyway. Calendars obtained by the Watchdog Group American Oversight show that Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin let, met at least three times with colony executives in the four months following the inaugural. In April 14th meeting with Mnuchin at a private room at the Georgetown restaurant Fiola Mare, I'm guessing, is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, included the ambassadors of, oh, you'll never guess, Oman, Kuwait, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, and Saud-owned Arabia. What a weird mix. That's crazy. Also at the dinner, Tom Barrack, Rick Gates. Barrack, who is of Lebanese descent and speaks Arabic, and so therefore may be Barak, has cultivated business ties in the Middle East over many decades. Something-something uh, jihad, totally arrest him. I don't know. I guess that's what we have to say about these things. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I don't support Trump. Sorry. I didn't mean any of that. In early 2017, Gates and Barack Barrack identified an investment idea. Hmm. Selling nuclear secrets to Saudi-owned Arabia? Is that it? No. It's an idea based on the Trump administration's emerging Middle East policy. Oh, so selling nuclear technology to... Oh, that's the same thing. Hmm. Barrack threw his weight behind a proposal to, oh my God, I'm right, spread nuclear power technology to Saud-owned Arabia and considered buying a stake in the U.S. reactor manufacturer Westinghouse. He told ProPublica in 2017, that plan stalled. What a dumb thing to say, by the way. These guys really just thought they were going to be able to get away with anything, right? I, so, okay, I'm a real estate investor. I open, you know, uh, office towers. Oh, I mean, I buy, I, I build nuclear power plants in Saud owned Arabia. That's, yeah, that's, that's my business. I really, it's amazing. So, okay, good. Lock him up too. He threw his weight behind this stupid idea that we mentioned as recently as yesterday, which was at least partially the brainchild of notorious spy Mike Flynn. Uh, we just learned, of course, that every time we ship or sell weapons to Saud-owned Arabia, they end up in terrorist hands. A great idea to build them a bunch of nuclear reactors because nothing will happen from that. It'll all be awesome and uh, we'll all enjoy lots of freedom as a result. Much of the February 2017 memo outlines how Colony could capitalize on Trump's Public-private infrastructure proposals, which have not materialized. Another great investment. Good eye there, Tom. Another document obtained by WNYC and ProPublica. An invitation list for the January 17th, 2017 inaugural event. The Chairman's Global Dinner shows the breadth of Barrack's international connections. The dinner was billed as a celebration for Washington's diplomatic corps, and it took a week to configure the Washington venue to accommodate the featured entertainment, a Las Vegas review known as <laughs> Steve Wynn's Showstoppers. And then afterward, I want you to come back to my room and stop my show. I don't know what that means. It's just, I think, well, it's appropriately disgusting. So there you go. That's the big deal. We have to, it takes a week to reconfigure. I want this whole room reconfigured for the Steve Wynn show. 
Hey, I'm going to come out and I'm going to drop my pants and the showstoppers are going to show you something that you won't believe. Uh, unbelievable. Even that a disgusting freak gets involved in that. Shoo! Just disgusting from top to bottom. Of all the people to be connected with. They could hardly avoid it there. But anyway, look, more names we recognize are coming up here. Let's continue with the article. In addition to ambassadors from around the world, because that's where ambassadors are from, over 100 guests from different walks of life (laughs) are listed as being invited by Barrick. Steve Wynn, he's from a different walk of life. Uh, This walk of life is different. Among them, Mohammed Alabar... Uh, what, I don't know how we would say it. Is it Al-Abar or Alabar? The way they spell it out here is no dashes or anything. A-L-A-B-B-A-R. What do you think? Muhammad Alabar, an Emirati property developer. Uh, you'll remember this guy, Yusuf Al-Otaiba, ambassador of the United Arab Emirates in Washington, and the ambassadors, uh, who they don't name, of Qatar and Saud-owned Arabia. Barrack's list also included Tennessee property developer Franklin Haney, who reportedly has drawn the focus of federal prosecutors in connection with his $1 million donation to the inaugural committee. Way to keep a low profile, Franklin Haney. Didn't know who you were, probably wouldn't have cared, and then the minute you did this, uh, you come up on everybody's radar. A $1 million donation to the inaugural committee. Haney did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Duh. Some events that week were reserved for high-dollar donors, you think? It's not clear which guests may have paid to attend the chairman's global dinner or what their contribution was. It's also not clear which invited guests actually attended. That's uh, kind of important, too. Colony, a publicly traded company, has not fared particularly well in the first two years of the Trump administration. That's odd, given their plans. A troublesome merger cost the company its CEO, and Barrick returned as chief executive last November. One bright spot, we should probably read a little bit about that. One bright spot for Colony's business in the Trump era, and you'd think they would have been able to skim unlimited amounts of money. They're probably very disappointed in all of this. One bright spot has uh, been more than $7 billion. That is very bright. In Of inflows to its investment funds. Ah, and that's what we're talking about here. So in other words, this uh, the, their actual business plans have all been flops. And they went through with a merger that didn't work out particularly well, and they had to fire the CEO. They're not doing particularly well with any of the grifting they meant to do off of infrastructure plans because there are no infrastructure plans. But where they've been doing well is that people have been giving them money for no particular reason, and despite the fact that they have earned nothing on uh, with, with their brilliant plans. I mean, the whole thing is, we have this big memo, we're close to the president, and this president is the biggest grifter of all time, and he grifts from some very, very deep-pocketed international scumbags. So we should be making out like bandits. So invest with us, And when we make out like bandits, we'll share the loot with you. Now, the big problem with all of this, I guess, is who invested? There's a number of ways for that to become a big problem. One, they could be corrupt in themselves, and they are. And two, they could be in an infinite feedback loop. Well, remember, our plan is to make lots of money by siphoning off a huge chunk of money invested by this international ring of grifters. And uh, if you want in on that, you should invest with us and we'll move that grift money to you. But the investment money that they got, let me just, I'll read you the paragraph. One bright spot for Colony's business in the Trump era has been more than $7 billion of inflows to its investment funds. A quarter of that from Saud-owned Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, the New York Times reported in June. So, By way of uh, money-making efforts, I don't know how well this is going to work out. If if I tell you that I plan to rip off money or siphon off money from Saud-owned Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, where there are huge piles of money just waiting to be stolen, everybody knows this, um, 
you might be like you, you listener might be excited about that prospect if you if you wanted to be an international oligarch gangster. And I could probably convince you to invest in my fund if I told you that I was going to steal from those giant pots of money. Now, how about if I told you, let's say, listener John Q. Public, billionaire, Mr. Q. Public, because that wasn't your middle initial, that's your last name, Q. Public. Um, I want you to invest in my fund. Wow. Uh, what kind of returns will I get? You'll get billions. What's your business plan? My business plan? You're not going to believe this. I love it. Don't tell anybody. Please sign this NDA. I'm going to rob John Q. Public. Would you invest? They did. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, that are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the King in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue to soldier on on our very own today. How about that as an investment scheme, by the way? Again, another one of those situations where you realize I'm just in the wrong business. Uh, I, I guess I'm not cut out for this one, but who really is cut out for this one? I guess all you got to do is get a suit and some business cards and walk into places and say, ta-da, I'm a hedge fund or whatever fund. I need you to invest in – this is a very difficult thing to do, really. I, talking people into just giving you money, it, it is a tremendous skill, and I shouldn't downplay it. I just don't really understand how it works. But I guess once you get money, if you can just get a bunch of money, whether you inherit it or whatever – and by the way, I did see something circulating yesterday I should have grabbed. Uh, maybe we can scare it up here, but uh, – I did see discussion yesterday that uh, I guess uh, uh, something like uh, the figure of 60% of America's wealth is inherited these days, right? Oh, Thomas, uh, as you say his name, Piketty is what it always looked like. And we decided we knew how to pronounce it in French at some point, except I don't really trust my memory of that. But let me grab that one. I knew I saw this floating around uh, the other day. Washington Post data reporter Christopher Ingram circulating this one per Thomas Piketty, Piketty, Pic, Pic, Picatois. I don't remember exactly what we decided to pronounce his name as. Roughly 60% of America's wealth is inherited, meaning most people, uh, most of America's riches are owned by people who didn't work for them, which may be possibly overbroad as a generalization, but pretty much captures the reality of it. Um, I mean, it's always sort of been the case because that's sort of where we are as a legal system in this country and all over the West. But uh, it's worth pointing out every once in a while that that's the case. And I guess if you have that money, then you can walk into places uh, where other people who have money are hanging around. That's, that's you know, what it means to grow up with money is you, you are a member of places like that. You belong in. They don't stop you at the door when you walk into places where other people who don't know what the hell they're doing haven't worked for their money but have lots of it and are taught that the thing people who have money for no particular reason do with their money is – give it in bits and pieces to other people who also don't really know why they have money. And sometimes you can parlay that into greater wealth. Usually it works that way. Sometimes it's because they say we're going to buy companies that produce things. And when we sell those things, we'll give part of the profit to you. And 
That is supposedly honest graft. I don't know how well the system works, but there you have it. But then there are others where uh, the plan is more along the lines of, well, you give us money it, and it, it moves in stages. Give us money and we'll buy a company with it. And they sell things, but we can't sell enough of those things in order to give you enough money to make you feel like you're getting your money's worth out of this. You could have bought stocks, for instance. We need to, you know, and, and you'd be earning, eh, you know, 5% return on things and you get little dividends and that's nice. In order to give you the 10% plus that you feel you're entitled to as a rich person who woke up or was born rich and was given money by their parents, we're going to have to push harder. We need to raid the pension fund of the companies that we're going to buy and steal that money that was put aside by the people who work and make the things that they sell. And that way we'll get the 10% return, which is what rich people like you and me are entitled to because remember, oh, by the way, uh, I need you to come out and vote for politicians that are going to cut entitlements for poor people because entitlements are disgusting. But you being entitled to things is is nice and fun and good and capitalistic, right? So we're going to raid the pension fund and <clears throat> uh, take the assets of the company to the bank and leverage them as far as we can to borrow as much money as possible from the bank based on the company's assets that we bought and then we're going to default on the loan, but keep the money. And you know what banks do when uh, when a, 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 a someone they've loaned money to, some entity to which they've loaned money defaults, <clears throat> they can uh, try to take possession of that thing. And we don't care because it's an LLC or it's a company and it's not us personally. We're going to keep the money and they're going to own the company at the end. And that's okay. Uh, and we might even be able to extend the graft out a little bit further, uh, the grift out a little bit further by uh, uh, trying to resolve things in bankruptcy and uh, not losing the company. But if we do, we do. And then the stage after that, of course, is I want to have one of these hedge funds because hedge fund people are billionaires or become billionaires. So what I should do, it's people like me. I wake up and I say, oh, all the money is in hedge funds. I should start a hedge fund. Now, my limitation on it is uh, twofold. One, I say, I don't know how to run a hedge fund. Uh, that's my first mistake. I don't know why I think that. Um, I shouldn't. Because a lot of people who run hedge funds also don't know how to run hedge funds. And there isn't a way to run hedge funds either. They're not things that have rules that's the whole point of them. Uh, my other problem, of course, is I don't already have a lot of money. The best way to convince people who have a lot of money to give you a lot of money is if you already have a lot of money. They then trust you. He's a person who has a lot of money. Must be because he either knows how to run a hedge fund or at the very least, he's not going to steal my money. He's already got lots of money. This is how we got Trump, right? I mean, this is, that was the whole point of Donald Trump his whole pitch to his supporters. I won't rip you off. I won't loot America. I'm already rich. I don't need to do that. I got rich by looting America. And this is a better opportunity to loot than ever before. But I won't because there's one thing Donald Trump is known for. It is moderation, personal moderation in all dealings. And people said, sure, it is. Absolutely. hundred uh, percent. And they elected him. Uh, maybe. Sort of. And uh, anyway, so as a hedge fund, you want to start a hedge fund, have money. Go to other people, say, give me more money. How, why would I give you money? You'll earn money. You got, uh, how will I earn money? I don't know. You got to spend money to make money. Everybody knows that, right? I do know that. And I am part of everybody. Go on. You've got me. You've got my attention. Right. So you give me money and I put it in the hedge fund and then, you know, you earn Money returns. That's how hedge funds work. Some people, that's enough. I have heard of these hedge funds. They are legendary, you might say. A president would never say that until now. But you might say it. Uh, lots of people make money with hedge funds. And some, for some people, that's enough. Others, I would demand to know how. Well, it's a secret. It's a secret sauce. That's what we do at hedge funds. I can't tell you or else you would be a hedge fund. And then you would get all this money. 
Uh, the point is you want to relax and enjoy money. Uh, you can feel like that's okay. Uh, I know you probably have a psychological problem somewhere in your head, even though you were born rich uh, and got used to it, is the idea that there, you need to do something for your money. A lot of people, the idle rich, don't probably typically believe themselves to be idle. I'm constantly doing stuff, not playing around, not, you know, goofing around. There are, you know, millionaire playboys, but I'm investing in things. I'm making deals. I'm constantly doing things. They're not really, but they are constantly involved in deal making. And the deal making is, can I give you, how much money should I give your hedge fund? Or if they're particularly enterprising, how much money can I get some other person to give my hedge fund? And then they just move the money around. Sometimes it really is nothing but a Ponzi scheme, as you occasionally see in the newspapers, people getting arrested for these things. And it's just, I'll, give me a million dollars for my hedge fund and you'll make money. And that's all you need to know. And I'm taking a million dollars from you. Go to the next person, put a million dollars in my hedge fund. They do. I give you, the first person, some percentage of what the second person put in there and claim it's a dividend. And I just walk around hustling people for million dollar checks at a time and occasionally do invest in something. I, you know, they're not all complete Ponzi schemes and crooks. It's just dumb stuff like, uh, hey, friend of mine, yo, uh, why don't you give me a million dollars for my hedge fund and you'll make lots of money? Ooh, well, I'll do you one better. Friend two is a better, a better hustler, right? I, 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 I'm not going to give you money for the hedge fund. But in fact, what I want to talk to you about, let's talk deals. You know, I'll, I'll make plans, lunch plans with you. Person A, I want you, uh, person B, friend of mine, to put money in my hedge fund. Person B says, Let's talk deal. Oh, okay. Uh, that gets him to lunch. And then at lunch, person B, who's a better swindler, says, actually, what I'm doing right now is I've got a startup. And it's a great thing. And it's awesome. It's like Uber, but for wetsuits. I just made that up. Uh, but it doesn't matter, right? Uh, wow. Is that a big market? You know, uh, oh, Sorry. You're thinking too normally. Is that a big market? Well, I don't know. I heard you say Uber, but for. Uh, so that's a good thing. So person B says, I've got a new startup. It's Uber, but for wetsuits. And uh, what I need is a million dollars in venture capital. Or even better, you could buy me out. Uh, that would be your investment. Like your hedge fund could own my Uber, but for web wetsuits uh, company. And sometimes that works. And you say, you know, remember, you're not dealing with people who will say Uber, but for wetsuits. Why would anybody want that? Who needs wetsuits? And, and what, what, what sense does that make? It doesn't matter. It's got a nice name. We got a logo that's got a swoosh in it. And, uh, you know, dot com is very hot right now or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You know, still believe, still sounds like a real thing to me. And uh, hedge fund then says, well, I don't know whether it's a good investment or not, but here's the deal. My friend owns it and I'm going to be vice president for global evangelism about wetsuits. So this is a pretty good deal. So here's what we'll do. The uh, I need 50 million of the dollars I collected from other idiots before I came to lunch with you. And if I don't have it, I can go around saying, I need more money for my hedge fund. One of the things we're going to do is invest in this awesome thing, Uber, but for web suit, wetsuits. And I then take the 50 million. I give it to my friend. He says, global vice president for uh, vice president for global evangelism for wetsuits. You, you know, that's a big deal. Here's $10 million plus some stock in this garbage outfit. And uh, you get to keep it because that's salary to you. Oh, good. I was thinking, I was wondering, when was I going to be able to withdraw millions of dollars from the hedge fund that I started? And I realized after doing it, I, I talked to a lawyer and he's like, no, you can't just keep the money people give you. That's and one of the illegal Ponzi scheme things we're always talking about. What you need to do is, you know. Well, for one thing, if you were running a legit one, what you need to do is go invest in a company and then make money off of that investment. So there you are. 
Uh, now what we do is we buy this stupid company. I become an officer of that company. The company pays me salary. That's clean dollars. That's money laundering. You just did it. Congratulations. You finally made it as a business uh, man. And uh, now that's it. And uh, so you have a successful investment under your uh, what? Under your hat? Where do you keep these things? Uh, keep doing it. Keep going. Uh, have more lunches with more people. Tell them about Uber, but for wetsuits. Uh, Michael Musson has the suggestion here. Wet, not wetsuits. They would be called net suits. And that's probably right. And that's why I keep wanting to go back to, I keep saying web suits instead of wetsuits, but maybe net suits is the better idea. So that's how your hedge fund works. Uh, you want to start one? Why have I not done this? I don't have rich enough friends. I'm embarrassed about stealing money. I don't like asking for money. I, I actually put out a show every day, two hours a day of this nonsense. Some people really enjoy it and you can support it entirely voluntarily and do it all online. It's like Uber, but for robbing a bank. I just sit here and money rolls in and I still won't ask you to do this. Uh, straightforwardly. I still hedge. Uh, that's what my, my, my world hedge funds is. I hedge about asking you for funds. People are making money doing this all over the place. I put out a nice product. I ask people to pay 25 cents a day for it whenever they download it. The stats tell me certain number of people are downloading each day. I should be clearing $100,000 a year off of this show. I could be paying Scott a genuine salary for doing the work that he does. I could, you know, like think I'm doing something productive in the world instead, but uh, I'm too, you know, I'm too shy about asking people for money. There's other people out there saying, please give me millions of dollars for this stupid idea. And stupid rich people are doing it and they just pass it from one thing to another. It's just a variant, really, just a a financialized variant of what they used to do or what their spouses, I guess, used to do back in the olden days when uh, gender roles ruled everything. They still do, I guess. Uh, when uh, what they called socialites would spend their time on charity events. That was... Uh, a reasonable thing to do for them. Uh, their husbands stole all the money and the wives shared all the money with charity. That's the label you would slap on it, but it was really just passing around checks from one charity to another. You'd have a charity ball and, you know, see, Donald Trump didn't invent this game either. You have a charity ball. I need to raise a number of millions of dollars for pediatric cancer charity. Yes, that's, and it's a real thing. Money actually went to the pediatric charity and uh i invite all of you rich people to this thing because that why wouldn't you invite rich people rob banks because that's where the money is invite rich people because that's where the money is come to my charity event everybody loves going to big parties so they would go and even better they realized what if what if instead of spending my money to go to the charity ball. I spent my charity's money to go to the charity ball. Why should I pay to do this when I have this other pot of money to use? And it might even be legitimate or could be totally illegal. Eh, but we never get caught on these things. So that's what you would do is you would go and even if it wasn't a charity, you'd use your parents' foundation, whatever. You know, it's a $50,000 a plate fundraiser huge amount of money terrific cause though even better i get to go to a party get to or have a new dress eat fancy food go to a beautiful location to do it and i don't actually pay the money my foundation pays the money it's charitable foundation so it's okay we just move check to check to check and then you know it's somebody else's turn and you know Muffy, who got all the money from the first one, now takes some portion of that money to pay for the tickets to the next person's fundraiser. And everybody passes it around. And that's not a pyramid scheme because something. Not a, There's no pyramid. I don't know. It's a mailing list that doesn't involve a pyramidal structure. And so it works. It's fine. Everybody just takes their turn and collects checks from everybody else. And uh, that's why the rich are different. So... Why can't I do this? Why can't I start a hedge fund? I don't know. I guess I could. 
I'm just uh, too embarrassed about stealing money from people because I was raised right and uh, not rich from the get-go. So it never occurred to me to do. But that's the way the world works. I just thought I'd bring you up to speed on that one. Uh, hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, stream of consciousness-wise, that reminds me. I did see a story circulating the other day uh, and a tweet thread about, I wonder if I can dig this thing up. It's another one that I should have been prepared with that the CE, well, I guess in the wake of all these layoffs in newsrooms around the country, um, I noted that someone else was noting that the CEO of McClatchy, which is a decent news organization, um, had, uh, uh, there we are. Columbia Journalism Review is where I saw it. Somebody must have tweeted it around. Uh, in the wake of all these uh, layoffs, I thought a very interesting story that the Columbia Journalism Review picked up. McClatchy upgrades CEO's housing stipend to $35,000 a month amid buyouts. That's not the whole story, uh, but it's an interesting portion of it. Amanda Darich, I'm guessing at the pronunciation of our, our writer here, BuzzFeed, HuffPo, Gannett, Vice. This has already been a ruthless year for layoffs in digital journalism. On Friday morning, McClatchy President and CEO Craig Foreman emailed employees to let them know 450 staffers across the enterprise, all aged 55 and over, would be offered early retirement. Sounds intriguing, right? Interesting. In his email on Friday, Foreman attributed this latest reduction in staff to the culmination of the enormous progress McClatchy has already made in our transition to a digital future. But the response among reporters didn't match his optimism. McClatchy laid off a bunch of folks, including me, back in 2018. Reporter Christian Boschelt tweeted as the news broke, hopefully the folks who don't take buyouts aren't let go. That's another uh, great corporate one-two punch. I'm offering you all early retirement so that we can non-violently reduce our payroll, which is, of course, uh, great because it gives money to me, the CEO, because I'm a job creator, something, something, never mind the fact that I am killing jobs right now. But, you know, uh, as we've mentioned before, don't let anybody tell you that businesses need tax cuts or any other sorts of funding because they are job creators. Jobs, payroll, payroll is a cost center. You do anything you can, just, you know, go to one day of business school. Anything you can to reduce your cost centers. Keep payroll as low as possible, preferably by paying the least number of people to do anything. All that money that you pay to people is money you can't keep. So, you know, get over the idea that they're job creators. Their main aim is to avoid creating jobs wherever possible. And wherever they exist, eliminate them. That's the first rule of doing business. So the idea that businessmen are job creators is entirely backwards. I'm sorry if that's new to you. Uh, it must mean you're a new listener to the show, but it's it was worth your coming over to hear this. All right. We hope that offering early voluntary retirement and shifting to a functional organization will create enough savings in operating expenses to avoid layoffs, says spokesperson Gene Siegel. That is our intention. McClatchy turned the digital corner, she says, with online ad sales surpassing 43.8% of total ad revenue. Uh, okay, so that's some garbage numbers in order to distract you from the one-two punch that we said they were likely to deliver. Please take the early retirement so that we don't have to fire anybody. And then those of you who say, nah, I think I'll wait to retire, actually, are then fired. Uh, we forgot to tell you that if you don't take the voluntary early retirement, we're going to fire you. So when I offer you early retirement, I know you might think the thing to do is to wait it out. It's not. Take it. Run. Run away. Okay. In 2017, Foreman's take-home pay from McClatchy was $1.7 million, excluding restricted stock. That's how much they paid him. His newest contract with the company, dated January 25, 2019, includes a base pay 
of one million dollars. One million dollars. A bonus of a million dollars as well. And 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 this is the part that really grabbed me. An additional thirty five thousand dollar monthly stipend. What in the ever loving F do you need a stipend of anything for? If you're being paid a base salary of a million dollars and you're going to get a bonus, it's in there, in the contract, of another million dollars. You're going to get two million dollars straight up cash. Is there anything else I can get for you, sir? Yes. More money. In fact, another $35,000 monthly would be nice. Uh, For what? I mean, I am paying you... $2 $2 million. Yes, well, I want another half a million, give or take. It's $420,000 a year, $35,000 a month. So almost another half a million dollars. I mean, why don't you just say I want my salary to be $2.5 million? I don't know. We need to structure it this way. Instead, $35,000 monthly stipend. Nobody needs a stipend. of. Well, first of all, a stipend of half a million dollars? Stipend. When I get stipends, $1,000 a month stipend. Right? $35,000 a month? I don't think so. According to uh, Siegel, this stipend, by the way, will be used to pay for foreman's travel, housing, office, that's a weird one, and security expenses. Now, everybody wants to be secure and stuff, but the, the, most of what was just listed there is for you, for me, for normal people, that's called, that's what your effing salary is for. You want to travel? Have at it. I pay you $2 million. Travel wherever you want. Housing, buy whatever you like. You make $2 million a year. Any house you want is yours for the taking. No, I need a stipend. You have to give me more money for that house. Office, that usually comes with, I must say. Okay, you have to pay for my office. Yes, that's true. That's part of working. Security expenses, eh, again, you feel like you need security. Well, it's attached to my job. And this is how all this works. I need to have security because my job, expo- I'm a public figure. I travel all over the place. I need security. Uh, maybe. Okay, fine. Sure. Uh, my office has to be paid for. All right, you win on that one. We should pay for your office. My housing. What? You're going to have to convince me. Well, first, let me move on to travel. I travel all over the world. Uh, making connections that are good for the newspaper. I bring in revenue that way. BS. No, you don't. Where are you traveling to? What? What? what I don't understand how going to a golf resort. Well, you know, deals are made on the golf course all the time. Oh my God, he's right. And maybe some of the travel is even for business to uh, ritzy locations, to be sure. But for newspaper conventions, damn it, fine. Uh, what about housing, though? Uh, no, I'm afraid you're responsible for that one. Wait a minute. I haven't finished yet. I need a lavish home where I can do lavish entertaining in order to convert all of these acquaintances I've met on my travel and in my office and through uh, places I have to go with security to convert them into investors in my hedge funds. I mean, this newspaper. Oh, my God. It worked. Another half a million dollars because... You want to have a fancy house that apparently I give you $2 million every year and you still need me to pay. I would like to have this house, but I would like to not have to pay for it. I would love to introduce you to this person over here who likes going to expensive charity balls, but doesn't want to pay for it. Want to be there. Don't want to pay for it. Supposed to be there because you can pay for it. I know I can, but I'm not gonna because I have a foundation to do it instead. You've got a stipend. You've got a foundation. The two of you need to get together. There you go. So this stipend alone, by the way, which is up from $5,000 from his previous contract, it, that was too much. But last year, they had a contract with them that said, we're going to give you another 5000 on top of everything, which is not a whole lot in the scheme of what else they're giving them. But why do you give them a stipend at all? And he says, I need you to multiply that. I need a larger one. I'm talking about, mm, let's say, seven times as much. Would that be cool? That's They really literally said, yeah, $5,000 a month, uh, excessive as it is, 
but we'll give you 35 instead, and there you go. Well, that stipend alone, as they point out, could fund several reporters' salaries every year. But instead, they're all laid off. So it doesn't really matter what business you're in, hedge fund, journalism, which is important and helpful and everybody appreciates it, whatever you're doing. It's all about extracting as much as you can from the people who are actually doing the work and then getting rid of them before they can figure it out, report on it, I guess, and complain. Amazing. I'm sorry. I didn't know we were going to end up on this, but it's as good a use of our time as anything. You want news? You want reaction to news? Stay tuned. West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We'll come back tomorrow when Greg is with us. Uh, but Justice Putnam will take you through it all including, uh, well, what was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez up to yesterday, along with her guest at the State of the Union. We'll hear all about that and much more, some of which I'll be able to cram in in just a moment. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The k in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. Here we go. Here's more. Texas GOP officials are facing three lawsuits over their transparently racist attempt to remove people from the state's voter rolls. Trump blames the Senate for nominations problems his administration has created. And the far right hated that Trump brought Jewish guests to the State of the Union. Those racists.